It's easy to preach after singing like that. Thank you all so much. Jamie, you sing like a girl, and I like it. I just want to say that. What a great tenor voice. I'm glad God blessed you with it, and I'm glad you're singing here. Um, just appreciate that so much. 2007 was 12 years ago from today. I don't know what you remember about 2007, but George W. Bush was the president. The Indianapolis Colts beat the Chicago Bears in the Super Bowl. He's the only one who cares about that. And a company called Apple introduced their first iPhone. Seems like so long ago. Well, I want you to keep that image of 12 years in your mind. Because the story we're reading this morning is all about a woman who suffered just that long. And we've been talking about our healer series and looking at times where Jesus interacted with people. And because they met with him, they were changed forever. And we find so many correlations in our own life to those individuals that what Jesus did for them, he can do for us. Mark chapter 5, I want to read you some verses out of verse 24. And I want you to get that there's a man named Jairus who has brought his daughter or come to Jesus about his daughter because she's about to die. And he asked Jesus to please come to his house and heal his daughter. And on the way, beginning in verse 24, it says that Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now I want you to get some things about this woman's condition. The Bible says she had an issue of blood. And we don't always know what that means, but we do know this. She suffered with it for 12 years. Now think back. 12 years, how old you were 12 years ago, how old your children were 12 years ago. George W. Bush is in the White House and nobody's even heard of an iPhone yet. So 12 years she struggled with this physical problem. And the Bible says that not only did she have a physical problem, but she went to the doctor and the doctors didn't make her better, they only made her worse. Now you know what happens when you go to the doctor and they can't figure out what's wrong with you? They try stuff on you. You know what I'm talking about. You become the lab rat who pays them to test new stuff on you. Yeah, and so she's going through all of these things for 12 years. She has spent all of her money, the Bible says. So she's broke, and she's not any better. In fact, the Bible says the doctors made her worse. And then we read the Levitical law in Leviticus chapter 19, and we find out that because she had an issue of blood, it made her unclean. Now, we don't understand that terminology in our culture, but here's what it meant. If you were unclean, you were not allowed to participate in social functions. In other words, you couldn't go to church. You weren't allowed at the cookouts. You couldn't go to birthday parties. People didn't invite you to their families. You became ostracized from society. Now, let me just remind you of something. If you have something wrong with you and it's visible to other people, you automatically at least garner some sympathy. They look at you and say, oh, man, your face looks terrible. I know that arm's got to hurt. Your legs look... Because they can see it. But when you're suffering with something that people cannot see, you don't even get the benefit of that natural sympathy. You can't ask people for money. They don't see anything wrong with you. But here you are, cast out of the temple, cast out of social functions. And according to rabbinical traditions, her husband would have divorced her because she was perpetually unclean for 12 years. And so here we have this woman who is physically suffering. She's broke. She's lonely. She's ostracized from society. But you know what? That was not her worst problem. Her worst problem was that she was lost. 
Because the spiritual condition is always greater than the physical condition. The Bible teaches us this plainly, that it's better for you to go to heaven missing an eye or missing a foot or missing a hand than to have your whole body and be cast into hell. And the most tragic thing she experienced was that her spiritual condition was an awful lot like her physical condition. Because see, here's what the spiritual side of things does to us. Every one of you in this room before you came to Jesus, you had a problem. And most of you had it a whole lot longer than 12 years. And you tried all kinds of ways to fix your problem can I make it real personal to you I don't know all of you here this morning so if you just did some of the things that I'm talking about I promise you I've not been stalking you on Facebook I don't know anything about it I just know the natural tendency of our hearts when we're trying to fix the ache that only Jesus can fix we go buy us a new truck we buy us a bass boat we get some new golf clubs We begin to pursue a bigger house and a better place. We begin to improve our education. We try to be more religious. Some of us slip down the slide and find some drug that makes us feel better to cover up that ache on the inside. Some of us find a bottle. Some of us find another partner to fix that ache on the inside. And what do those doctors do to us but the same thing that her doctors did to her? They take all of our money, and they don't leave us any better. They leave us in worse shape than what they found us because we are learning in our experience that nobody can heal the ache of a human heart. There's nothing in this earth that can fix the hole that's inside of us that can only be found at the feet of Jesus Christ. But we know we sure have tried to fix it, and we have spent an awful lot of money trying to fix what only Jesus Christ can fix. And here she is in all of her struggle and situation, in that spiritual condition of being lost and suffering. And I can imagine her sitting at home, and she thinks about these things. And the Bible says she decides to go to Jesus probably because she heard about him. And she says, I ain't got nothing to lose. Nobody talks to me anyway. I can't go to church. But if he's passing by, if I can just, if I can just touch him, maybe it'll work. What do I have to lose? Remember the old song we sing? Victory in Jesus. You know that song? The second verse says, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the, talk to me, lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. What is it that motivates us to go get help? Hearing what God has done for somebody else. And if there's no other reason to come to church, I need to come to church to see what God's doing for you Because I know if he did it for you, he's able to do it for me. And as she's sitting there at home, she says, I have heard that he's healed blind people, that he's made the lame to walk again, that he has caused the blind to see, that he has raised the dead. And if I can't do anything else, I'm just not going to stand in the crowd. I'm going to reach out, and I'm going to touch him. Now, when I grew up in Sunday school, I always heard that she touched the hem of his garment. How many of you have heard that expression? Sure, that's the idea in Scripture. But then I begin to read these words. What does touch mean? What does him mean? And so in my mind, I saw this really small woman down below everybody's feet. And as Jesus came walking by, she reached out and grabbed that little hem of his garment as he went by. And instantly she was changed. That's not what it means. It's not what it means. All right? Here's what I want you to think about. I brought a scarf with me. And this scarf is kind of like the prayer shawl that a Jewish man would wear. There's this broader, but it does have fringe, and they wear it like this. And Jesus would have worn his because he came to fulfill the law, the Bible says. So he's wearing this shawl. And if you notice, as he walks, it would flutter behind him. And the hem is the word fringe. So he's walking with this behind him. And the word touch. I began to study that word touch. And that word touch means to make something your own, to grab and possess. That's what it means. Put it to you this way. I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and for a long time I didn't have a southern accent. I didn't. But when I go visit my grandfather who lives in Cleveland County and we'd be out working on his farm, he'd hand me something and I'd mess with it and he'd say, grab a holt of it, son. You know what I'm talking about? A holt. You know that word? All right. He'd grab a holt of it. And he means get it and do what? Hang on to it, all right? That's the idea. And so here's the picture. Is this, this woman came through the crowd. 
No one she's unclean. No one she's ostracized. And as Jesus passes by and everybody's grabbing and pulling at him because he is the biggest celebrity that ever came through town. He has the ability to heal, change, and transform. He has fed 5,000 people with bread and fish. He has raised the dead. People are just flocking him. As he comes walking by, she reaches through the crowd and she grabs this, just the backside of it, and pulls. And then she lets go. And Jesus stops. You know why she let go? Because the Bible said instantly she felt that blood dry up inside of her and she knew that she was healed and her plan was just to touch and disappear into the crowd. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but let me just tell you all this this morning. You're here. Jesus is passing by. There's a whole crowd of us in this room. Don't be the one that just looks, that just watches. Be the one that reaches out and grabs and says, I'm not letting you go till you bless me, like Jacob told the angel. Jesus is coming by. How many times will he come by? I don't know, but he's here this morning. And if you're here and you need something, grab a hold. Get a hold of it. Understand that he wants you to hang on until you get what you need. Do you know how you act when you're desperate? to? When it's your last chance? If you were about to drown and I threw this to you? How tight would you hang on? Grab Jesus just like that. And don't let go till you get what you need. He wants to bless you. He wants to honor you. He wants to give you what you ask for. Why did her touching his robe work? Because he wanted it to work. He knew who she was. He knew where she was. And when he turned around and said, who touched me? Because he didn't know. He wanted to deal with her. And he said, this virtue is passed out of me. And I want you to know that word virtue is dunamis. We get the word dynamite from it. He said, some dynamite just left my body. And I want to know who got it. I'll tell you who got it. The one who was willing to press out and grab a hold and say, I need something and I'm not leaving till I get it. And I wish God would fill Liberty Baptist Church with people who are desperate enough about their condition to say, I'm not sitting at home. I've been like this for 12 years. I've been like this for 50 years. I'm tired of it. I'm going to get what I need and whatever it takes, I'm going to grab him and I'm not going to let go until he gives it to me. That's what Jesus is looking for. That's who he honors. Lots of people touched him and grabbed him, but only one woman got the healing and he gave it to her because she needed it and she was willing to do whatever it took to get it now you're here this morning and I don't know what you need I can't see your hearts but I know Jesus is passing by and he comes by here a lot and as he passes by this morning don't just observe in curiosity don't just come to see the miracle worker to see other people worshiping get what you need when you're here don't just make it another Sunday. Jesus is passing by. Grab hold and allow him to change and transform life forever. That was her condition. She got what she needed. But I want you to get this. Jesus had to correct some things about her faith because she had great faith, but it was imperfect faith. Aren't you glad that Jesus honors imperfect faith? Aren't you glad that you don't have to know everything for Jesus to speak to you and work in your life? Aren't you glad that you don't have to do everything and understand everything? But Jesus is not willing to leave us where we are. He always desires to bring us to where we need to be. He'll accept us on the wrong terms, but he won't let us stay there. The Bible uses this phrase, Jesus does not quench the smoking flax. Now, how many of you have ever been camping? Yeah, I see on Facebook some of y'all are camping. I like camping. Enjoy that sometimes. It's not so much fun with a two-year-old, but when he gets a little older, we're probably going to do some more of it. And, you know, when you build that fire, who can prevent forest fires? Only you. Just remember that. Only you. And so when you build that fire, all right, you're about to go to bed at night, what are you supposed to do? Put it out. That's exactly right. Pile all the trash up on it and go to bed. No, you put it out. And it's not just enough to just dump water on it, what are you supposed to do? Spread it out. Why are you spreading it out? <clears throat> You're looking for that little coal. You know what I'm talking about? Because you'll be amazed that you can go to bed at night and get up in the morning and that little coal will still be hot enough to burn you. And so when you see that little bit of smoke coming out, you just step on that, make sure it's all out, spread it all out. That's what we do. The Bible says that's not what Jesus does. Well, see, when he sees that little wisp of smoke of, of faith beginning to burn, even though it's imperfect, the Bible says he doesn't quench that smoke and flax, but he blows on it. 
because he wants to fan it into something bigger and greater. He accepts our imperfect faith, but he wants to make it great faith. And so he begins to deal with this woman. Now notice he calls out, who touched me? He knew who touched him. He just wanted her to come forward. And he begins to address her. Notice when he sees her, he says, Daughter, verse 34, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now what did she think had made her whole? This robe. Yeah, she thought there was some power in the robe. Is there any power in the robe? No, there's only power in the relationship, all right? Jesus is the power, but the robe's not the channel. The faith uh, is the channel. And let me just go ahead and remind you, all you superstitious people in this room, uh, there's no such thing as holy water, being anointed with oil, prayer cloths, being baptized in the River Jordan, or your grandmother's Bible. None of those things has special power. And I'm not trampling on anything sacred to you. I just want you to know that the power is in Jesus Christ, and faith is the channel to get it. Uh, nothing else will give it to you, all right? You can pay the money and fly over there and get baptized in the Jordan River, but you'll still be struggling with everything you left at home when you get back home, because that won't change a thing. Even if you have some relic that belonged to the Apostle Paul himself, uh, it has no power behind it. I remember when I was a little boy, a man came to Norfolk, Virginia, where I grew up, and his name was Sweet Daddy Grace. Uh, anybody know who Sweet Daddy Grace is? All right, that was his name. And when he came to, Sweet, came to Norfolk, Sweet Daddy Grace was selling gallon jugs of holy water. You can buy it by the jug. And he sold out of his gallon jugs of holy water. And so they got the holy water fire hose, and they sprayed people off with the holy water. I evidently missed it because it didn't do anything for me and it didn't do anything for anybody else either and I remember somebody coming home and telling my dad Tommy I got me some holy water he said you know where that holy water came from he said it's the same water in your spigot it's the same water that fills up your toilet every time you flush it that's what it is because there's no power in those things there's no power and Jesus tells this woman don't be attached to the robe <laughs> Be attached to the person wearing the robe. I'm the source of power. I'm the only one who can heal you. And so I just remind you, there's no special song that they can sing or coming to the right building or to the place and coming down to an altar and everything just being emotionally perfect, and that's when the change takes place. It's not in superstition. It's in the person of Jesus Christ himself. So I don't care if the rooster that you have at home is a direct descendant of the one who crowed when Peter denied the Lord. Go ahead and kill and eat that sucker. There ain't no power in him at all. None of that can help us. Only Jesus Christ. He is our source of strength. So as you look around this room, here's what you will not find in here. There are no pictures of saints. No, no crucifixes. No crowns of thorns. Occasionally we bring them out for special times. But we want you to understand that our confidence is not in those things. They don't have any power. The power is the person who hung on the cross. The power is in the person who wore the crown. The power is in the person who rose from the grave. And if you know him, you have the source. It's not in the robe. It's in the relationship. And Jesus had to get her to know that. Uh, the second thing he had to correct about her was that her faith was self-centered. She was interested in getting healed, but she wasn't interested in the healer. She wanted just to touch him and then disappear into the crowd. And Jesus said, oh, no, no, come out. We need to talk, me and you, because God wants us to understand that while he'll accept our elementary faith, he is not willing to leave us in that place. So what is it that motivated you to come and trust Christ for the very first time when you got saved? You can tell me. What was it? I don't want to die and go where? I don't want to go to hell. That's self-preservation. That is selfishness. But when you came down to an altar and said, God, I don't want to go to hell. Please save me. What did he do? He saved you because he responds to that selfish, immature faith. Aren't you glad he does? Oh, yeah. But he's not willing to leave you there. He wants to develop that faith so it becomes selfless. Or it begins to be focused on what I like and what I want and what I need. And begins investing itself in what he loves and what he wants and what he needs, which is the lives of other people. That's what he want to get. That's where he wants to get us to. And it's that mature love. I told you this before, but my grandmother lived in Columbia, South Carolina, and I would go and visit her when I was a child. And I love visiting my grandmother because she let us watch stuff on TV I wasn't allowed to watch. Y'all know what y'all do, grandparents. Y'all know. 
all right? She would always give me candy in between meals, which I wasn't supposed to have. And whenever I left her house, she would give me $5. I love my grandmother. Yeah, absolutely. But about 2006, my grandmother's mind was gone, and I'd come over to the house, and she wouldn't know who I was. She was watching the Golden Girls on a loop. She loved that show, and unfortunately, I've seen most of them. And I'd cut her grass, clean up what I could, talk to her for a minute, and then I'd leave. Because I love my grandmother. You see, my love had changed. It wasn't the love that just wanted what she could do for me. My love matured into I loved her for who she was. And even if she couldn't do anything for me, I was going to do everything for her. And see, Jesus accepts our faith when we just come all wrapped up in us. He takes us just like that. But, oh, he will not leave you like that. He says, oh, no, you're coming with me. It's about me and you and what I want you to invest your life in. And I'm just here to remind you, if your salvation experience has just been a fire insurance, just something to keep you out of hell when you die, but has never motivated you to dedicate your life to the interest in which Jesus is interested in, to serving and giving your life for others, uh, you're still at an immature level of faith if you have faith at all. He's willing to pull us to himself and take us further than we ever intended to go. She wanted just to get healed. He wanted much more for her than that. And he says, daughter, your faith has made you whole, and it's about me and you and our relationship. And then the third thing Jesus had to correct was that she wanted to keep it quiet. She wanted to have an experience with Jesus and nobody know about it and to disappear into the crowd. But Jesus said, oh, Oh, no, it doesn't work like that. Because here's what I want to remind every one of you. If you've ever met Jesus Christ, eventually it will come out. It's got to come out. It cannot stay inside of you. And someone who says they've been saved and they've been saved for 25 years and nobody else knows it, I begin to wonder if you ever really got what I got. Because there's something on the inside that while you may struggle with it and stifle it and try to keep it down, it cannot avoid ever being known. It's got to come out and reveal itself. So if I went down to the plant with you and I asked other people, is that man a Christian? What would they say? If you got Jesus on the inside, they're going to know eventually. That person is different. There is something about them. I want what they have. I want to know about it. That individual has Jesus because Jesus will never let us stay where we are. He always makes us come forward and make it a public thing. You can't have silent faith. Real faith makes it a public thing. And I want everyone in this room to know that while Jesus will accept your immature, self-centered faith, When you come to him, he wants to fan it into something white hot so that the rest of the world knows that that individual has been with Jesus. So Jesus corrects her imperfect faith. But then he leaves her with this this comfort. And I want you to notice it with me. The Bible says, he says, who touched me? And she comes, notice with me in verse 33, fearing, trembling, but knowing she was healed. And she fell down before him and told him all the truth. What does that mean, all the truth? I think she fell down before him and said, I've been sick for 12 years. I've, I've been to all the doctors. I've, they've, they've took all my money. I ain't got no help. And I was just sitting at home, and I was concerned that maybe, I, I, maybe this would help me. And I went, and I just thought I'd just touch your garment, and I did, and I was healed. But I wasn't trying to hide it or be dis, dishonest. He just he makes this phrase, makes this statement. Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. What does daughter mean? Because here's what I want you to get about this woman. Was she healed? Yeah, that's an easy question. Some of y'all can talk to me. You didn't say anything all night. Was she healed? Yeah, she was healed. Was she still poor? Mm. Was she still ostracized? Still divorced? Mm -hmm. Still kicked out of the church? Yeah, all of those things. But she was healed. And he looks at her and says, Daughter. Family terms. Nobody else wants you, but I want you. I have one daughter. I have four sons. Three of them are, four of them are here this morning. One's in the nursery. My daughter's not here. She's in Virginia Beach, Virginia, because she's going to college, working on her 
postgraduate degree. And a few weeks ago, I moved her and her husband up there. And as I unloaded her stuff into their little tiny apartment about the size of this stage in Virginia Beach for $800 a month, I looked at her and I said, baby girl, that's our name. A lot of y'all use that, I know. She looked at me and she said, sugar daddy. Y'all didn't know I was a sugar daddy. But I am to one girl, one girl. And I said, if there's anything you need, you call daddy. I might be five foot five and 400 miles away, but if I can't get here, I know rough men who are willing to do violence on my behalf. And they can get here very fast. And whatever it is you need, I will help you with it because you are my daughter. Even if it means that you messed up and did something terrible, I'll come with the shovels, we'll bury the body, and we'll do our very best not to let anybody know it. Uh, because she's my daughter. There's nothing I won't do for her. And as much as I love all of you, if you harm her, I will smoke check you with whatever caliber you choose. 30 alt 6, 223, 308, 45. I, I can do, I got all of it. Brother Dusty, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't be messing with my daughter. God has established me as her protector, and I have transferred that responsibility to her husband. But should he be derelict in his duties, I will step in and fill the gap. That's my daughter. And if I, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto my children, how much more does my heavenly Father know how to take care of good gifts unto me? And he looks at her in the face with all of her. I didn't know what was going on. He says, baby girl, I take care of it. I know you're broke. I know you're lonely. I know you're outcast. But I have made you my own. You are part of my family now. Go home. Be of good courage. Go in peace. That's what he says to her. And she leaves there suffering from all of the things that she's suffering. But she's got a skip in her step for two reasons. The first one's obvious. She's been healed. For 12 years she struggled and now she's healed and delivered. Why could she not be happy? But more than healed, she has been taken from the family of the devil and made a child of God. And God Almighty looked down from heaven and looked her in her eyes into the depths of her soul and he says, you are my daughter. You are my son. You belong to me. You are a child of God. And let me just remind you, you come dragging in here this morning with all of the things that are just part of our life. But if you have the title of child of God, you have a reason to rejoice and shout in which no one else in this world has a right to do so. You're a child of God. And she left with this hope. He called me daughter. Nobody else wants me, but God wants me. And if God wants me, then that's enough. That's enough. So I want to ask you this morning, those of you who are here, listening to me, where are you at? Are you in the crowd, watching him as he passes by, knowing you got need, but trying to fill that need with broken cisterns that can hold no water, trying to quench that thirst in your soul with things that can never satisfy and only cost you more and leave you worse? Are you there? You there? He's passing by. Reach out and touch him. He'll take your imperfect faith, your misunderstandings. He'll take all of that, and he'll make you into what he desires for you to be. Just grab him and hang on till God does something for you. And those of you who know the Lord, struggling and suffering with the things that are so much a part of this life, he calls you his daughter. He calls you his son. And if he's called you that, you can rest assured that the purposes that he has established in your life, he's going to perform them until the day that Jesus Christ returns. He has got this, and he will fight for you. And the Bible says, Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who shall separate us from the love of God? And all of these things, we are more than conquerors. And so lift up your heads. Look up. Let your heart be filled with joy. God's in charge. He's on his throne. And he's accomplishing his purposes. And he's passing by this morning. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Bow your heads with me just for a moment. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you're in the business of healing sick and broken people. And Lord, we take our place with this woman 
It's people of desperate need who have struggled a long time and yet found no resolution for our problems anywhere. But we come to you with this hope. Father, I'd ask for every heart that's present this morning that they would not leave this place just like they were when they got here, but they would reach out and grab Jesus Christ as he passes by, grab that fringe of his garment and hang on till they get what they need, till they can look God face to face and know that they're part of his family. We thank you for this privilege in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? I would remind you that while coming to an altar is nothing special in and of itself, the altar is open to you. More importantly than coming forward, don't let Jesus pass you by this morning.